Okay, so welcome to the latest episode of the uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs podcast. Uh, my name is Tim DeForest. I'm the author of several books on pulp magazines, old time radio, and other aspects of pre digital pop culture. I keep a blog about such things at comics, old time radio, and other cool stuff. And with me today are my uh, regular co hosts, Jess and Scott. Uh, Jess, you want to introduce yourself? Well, my name is Jess Terrell, and you might know me from the Facebook discussion group. For the love of all things, Edgar Rice Burroughs. I'm Scott Stewart, freelance uh, writer and editor, fan, obviously, of ERB, and a fan of ERB fans, too, because, like, Jess and, and Tim here and, and other people I meet who are writing current ERB materials and the artists, there's just a great community there and, and uh, a lot to be thankful for. Um, well, Numa Yud. Numa Pohl. Jess Bundelo. Now that's an example of the Mangani language, uh, the language spoken by the great apes that raised Tarzan. And as we learn in later novels, it's also spoken by monkeys, it was spoken by Indonesian orangutans, and the Sagos of Pellucidor, the sort of Neanderthal men of the Pellucidor, also speak it as their language. So it seems to be a universal primitive language, and implicitly, it's the original source of all modern languages. What I said just there was a lion, just now was that a lion was coming. Scott pointed out that the lion was hungry and just declared that he would kill the lion. So just, you need to get to that. I'm coaching, coaching him as we speak. There we go. Uh, Mangani is a guttural language. It doesn't use articles such as the and a, but just uses the nouns. It doesn't use conjunctions. So you don't say, you know, a tree and leaf. You just say tree leaf, um, just uses the words. It is in every way a very simple and basic way of expressing basic information. Uh, you couldn't have a satisfying philosophical discussion with an ape, but you could state simple facts. Um, there's a wonderful article, and I'm a, probably going to mispronounce the name of the article's author, Yaro or Jaro uh, Aparella, um, who wrote an article about the Mangani language published in ERB zine number 2113. It's very informative. It goes into the language in much more detail than we just did here. And I'll put a link to that article in the show notes. And it's really worth checking out. It's a well-written article. If, if I could interject here, mm -hmm. in addition to that article, uh, Gerald has a really good ERB or Mangani English uh, dictionary over at the erbzine.com website, which I highly recommend. Okay. Yeah. It's just worth checking out. <laughs> and well i believe i hear the apes of kerchak in the background they're telling us that we have actually two features coming up uh one is uh um our trivia contest and uh we did a trivia contest last time and we got several entries of i think uh, a number of correct answers we picked somebody randomly and our winner was named Joseph. He won a copy of the new authorized library edition of Tarzan, uh, Tarzan at the Earth's Core. And he was kind enough when he uh, let me know that he had received it to, to detail his first experience with Burroughs. Um, and I'm quoting from his email here. I got hooked on Burroughs 60 years ago during the big Burroughs revival of the 60s. My entrance into the world was the Princess of Mars. For a long time, I avoided the Tarzan books. I wasn't a fan of how he had been portrayed in the movies. I love the Pellucidor stories. So when Tarzan at the Earth's core came up to be read, I discovered I, I discovered I liked Burroughs' version of Tarzan, and I devoured all the Tarzan books. So this book, the one he got as a prize, does have a special significance for me. And just we're glad that worked out for you, Joseph. We are happy to have sent you the book, and we uh, appreciate your participating in the trivia contest. And that was something I never thought about with like the Johnny Weissmuller films and all of that. I enjoy those movies for what they are, but they are, they're not an accurate portrayal of Tarzan as he's shown in the books. So someone who doesn't care for the movie character, they might not realize that they could probably still enjoy the books. Um, so I wonder if those movies are occasionally responsible for someone passing by a chance to re read a Tarzan book. Um, you know, something to think about. I'm glad we've had more recent movies that are a little more accurate to the character. And, and when you consider that Tarzan has been with us for around about 100 years, mm -hmm. 
well since 1912. Yeah, yeah, that's about 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, then it, it makes you wonder if, if indeed that that is the case. And I think you may be onto something there. It makes you wonder how many potential Tarzan fans were turned away because they felt that the ape man was too uh, bestial. Yeah, it, it's something to think about. Um, but we do have another trivia question this time, and I will be asking that question in just a moment. Uh, those of you who know the answer to this, you can you can send the answer into our e our podcast email at eggersmailbag at gmail.com. And that is where we will look for winners is there. We will, of all the correct answers we get, we will pick one randomly. That person will win a copy of the authorized uh, library edition of uh, um, Tarzan and the Lost Empires, when, um, where he encounters a remnant of the Roman Empire. It is probably my favorite of the lost uh, land books in the Tarzan series uh, because he gets to, you know, he gets put in the gladiator arena, which is just an epically cool idea by itself. So somebody can win that book. So send the answer to the Eggers mailbag at gmail.com. If we, we need to have a centralized location to get these answers uh, just for practical reasons. So if you, if you post the answer on social media or somewhere else, you won't qualify to be a winner. Uh, we will pick one winner out of all the right answers we get. Um, and here's the trivia question for this time. Who was the daughter of Tars Tarkas? Um, so once again, who was the daughter of Tars Tarkas? If you know the answer, send it to Edgar's mailbag at gmail.com. That email address will be in the show notes. So you'll be able to find it there um, and send us it. Anytime we're recording this on September 19th, 2022, um, and it will release sometime later this week. So um, uh, we will, I will wait uh, probably two weeks. So I'm going to say October 1st, I will pick an answer from, uh, from the answer, a winner from the correct answers we get. Uh, so once again, who was the daughter of Tars Tarkas? Send the answer to our email address. And that gonna, that's going to bring us to the book we're discussing today, which is Tarzan and the Ant-Man, which was uh, written in 1923 and serialized in Argosy All Story Magazine in February of March of 1920, February and March of published as a book in September of that year. It is uh, just a very interesting book. It's a great adventure story. Is I read somewhere once that somebody said it felt like a Barsoom adventure, that if Tarzan, if, if Burroughs has written this as a John Carter adventure, it would have felt perfectly at home um, on, on the Red Planet. It still works as a Tarzan adventure as well, um, but there is like a lot of super scientific stuff going on with Tarzan getting shrunk down to Ant-Man size, and that would have fit perfectly on Mars. Um, but as, it, with, as with the sword play. Yes, it would. Yeah, that's true, too, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of swordplay, especially towards the end of this book. Um, so this could have easily been a John Carter adventure or a, um, a Carthoris adventure or just, a, you know, another of the of the male heroes we meet along the way in the Barsoom adventures. But he, Burroughs choose, chose to make it a Tarzan adventure, and we won't argue with that decision because he writes a wonderfully entertaining book. Uh, thing I'm going to note is that uh, Burroughs does uh, give some political opinions in this book. Um, he is going to be openly critical of two relatively recent constitutional amendments, the income tax amendment from 1913 and prohibition, which had passed in 1917. Um, and he's going to be, I think, obviously critical. He's going to use aspects of Ant-Man society to criticize uh, these amendments, which I think he clearly disapproved of. He does in other books sometimes give political opinions. Uh, Pirates of Venus, the bad guys were obviously a satire of the Soviet Union, and he was criticizing communism pretty overtly. Um, they, I love a, I, I am a barbarian, which uh, we talked about in our last episode. He's he takes some shots at FDR's New Deal um, by a, by pointing out similar aspects of Roman ancient Roman society. So he does occasionally put political opinions into a book. And here in Ant-Man, he just went to town with it. Um, if we assume the book was partially inspired by Gulliver's Travels, then that kind of makes sense because Jonathan Swift used Gulliver's Travels for social satire. 
and political satire. And um, Burroughs is kind of doing the same thing here with Tarzan and the Ant-Man. Um, I think another thing we're going to mention about it is that this is the uh, the fourth of what could be seen as a little mini series within the series. Um, each we have four books where uh, the previous book of some plot thread of the previous book leads into the next one. Tarzan the Untamed is covers the World War One years where uh, Tarzan thinks Jane is dead. Um, that leads into Tarzan the Terrible, where he trails Jane and the Germans who have captured her to the lost land of Palu Don and rescues her. Tarzan and the Golden Lion, those two, uh, Tarzan and Jane and Korak on the way back from Palu Don, when they meet, they uh, um, find the Lion Club, who will grow up to be the Golden Lion, and have an adventure with him. And in this book, one of the villains from Golden Lion, Esteban Miranda, who ended the last book as a prisoner of cannibals, is going to show up once again and be an important plot thread in this one. So you have four books in a row where one leads directly into the other, at least in some way. And um, um, so you have like your little Tarzan mini series there, which, um, which is kind of neat. Um, this is also the last time we'll see Korak in the original books. And there is one book, I think, Tarzan's Quest. We just, I think you said you thought it was the 19th one. Yes, number 19. That, yes, that's the, la that's the only other time we'll see Jane. Um, and it's interesting to think about because Burroughs had originally intended to kill Jane off for real in Tarzan the Untamed in order to free Tarzan up to, uh, to have just more adventures. And he eventually solves that problem by just having Tarzan be uh, you know, the world's most inattentive husband, who's always off in the jungle, having adventures, running into new lost civilizations without any mention of Jane at all. Um, I'm making a little bit of fun there because we later see in Tarzan's quest that they still have a healthy marriage. But they apparently, uh, eventually, you know, Jane apparently realized that she's got to let Tarzan go out and wander around the jungle sometime in order to, in order to just stay happy. And she's apparently okay with that. She may so, also be attending to their businesses' interests, which are probably based in London, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, they get away from them once, uh, Tarzan and um, Jules of Opar. Mm -hmm. where, uh, Tarzan stated that uh, his business interest had had some trouble and uh, never really explained the details of what happened there, except that the, he needed to go get some more um, uh, precious jewels and, and gold and stuff from uh, Opar in order to um, re replenish the money the business had lost. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and I think that makes sense. You, you would trust Jane to run the business intelligently because she was one smart lady. And um, you would, um, um, you know, and obviously after uh, you know, they had lost their fortune at least twice. It happened in Golden Lion too, didn't it? And whenever he goes off to Opar for more gold to repl replenish their fortune, that never goes well. You know, he'll end up with amnesia or he'll end up a prisoner or he'll end up with like a, his evil double fooling Jane into thinking, you know, he's forgotten her or whatever. So I could see Jane saying, okay, I'm going to go run the business. You just stay away from law and I'll, <laughs> I'll keep the business profitable. Okay. So speaking of romantic entanglements, as I recollect, this is the last of the books that, uh, that really features Tarzan as the only lead character. Mm -hmm. I may not be stating that quite right, but beginning with uh, Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle, book number 11, and this is the Ballantine numbering system that I'm using here. Um, uh, that's a, uh, that the another character in that book, James Blake, takes center stage in, with his uh, adventures and his romantic entanglements, which permits Burroughs to work some romance into the story. Tarzan's there. He's definitely a force. He's still a central character. Um, and, and he and he does uh, leave his mark in in the uh, story of uh, Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle, no question about it. But James Blake gets the romance out of the deal. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I and, think that's very. Excuse me. I was uh, forgive me. I was I was going to say that that is the first of those books where 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 there's another central character besides Tarzan, which is kind of a theme you see throughout the remaining stories. Now you can go ahead. Okay. And just before we dive into the chapter summary, I wanted to say one thing. Uh, about the political points and satire that Burroughs is doing. I think it is clear when he gets to Ant-Man society that he uses aspects of it to, to um, express what I think were sincere criticisms of, ex of income tax and prohibition. 
And I think those were, I get the impression those were his sincere beliefs that he was expressing in this story uh, through the Ant-Men. Uh, there are aspects of the Alalu society, the society he'll meet where women are in charge instead of men, which I believe is commenting on the 19th Amendment, which had just passed a few years before in 1919 that gave women the vote. And I believe here he's satirizing not women getting the vote, but he's satirizing some of the concerns people had when they fought against the amendment and giving women the vote, which they were afraid it would destroy the family structure, the men wouldn't be in charge anymore, families would fall apart, women would just, you know, uh, stop being homemakers and all of that. There was all these like wild concerns that if you gave women the vote, society as we know it would collapse. Um, because the, the Alalu society will be with the women in charge, treating the men rather brutally. Eventually, because Tarzan teaches one of the men to use a bow and arrow, the men will take over and they're still going to treat the women uh, pretty poorly. Um, and the women are presented as thinking, oh, well, that's okay, we kind of like this. And when we look at the marriages amongst Tarzan's character, uh, Burroughs' characters, Tarzan and Jane, Deja Thoris and John Carter, David Innes and Dion the Beautiful, these are all marriages that are based on mutual respect and real love where you can never, you couldn't imagine Tarzan or John Carter ever being abusive, either physically or emotionally to their mates. They love them and they respect them. Definitely. And these are strong women or who are presented as intelligent and capable. So, um, so I believe that he is, I think that he, when we look at the Allahus, he is satirizing uh, the concerns people had about, you know, family and society falling apart if we gave women the vote. And he is not commenting that a proper marriage is one where the man is just like abusively dominant over the women. Um, he is just using exaggeration and satire in order to just tell people they were being silly when they're, of, of their, with their concerns. I, I think I think to um, to underline that about the um, the male female relationship in this role reversal world of the Allahus, I think is what we're calling them. Um, uh, if if those guys were really truly smart, as they age and they're throwing out of the nest, so to speak, to fend for themselves, when they hit that forest, they all just keep on going, mm -hmm. as, opposed, as opposed to loitering around there in, in the woods, which is waiting for. Um, someone to come one of those warrior women to come back and and scoop them up for a mate mm -hmm. uh, if, if they had if they had the um the gumption to go and face the brave new world that lies beyond that forest um they if they had the courage and the gumption as i say yeah. then they would do that but i think that illustrates that they don't that they, yeah. they don't know what to do with themselves so they just kind of loiter around there waiting on something to happen it finally yeah. does they they've been completely beaten down so Okay, so uh, if, if I think we can get into the chapter summary here, what we're going to do is summarize five chapters at a time and then comment on it. Um, no, excuse me. Um, so, and I am using, by the way, the excellent chapter summaries that you find on erblist.com. Um, we all, you know, we read the book, or in this case, I listen to the new audio version to prepare for this podcast. But we'll, um, using these chapter summaries just helps us to remember a lot of details that we might have forgotten otherwise. Um, and I appreciate these chapter summaries enormously. Uh, so to start off with chapter one of Tarzan and the Ape Men, we actually don't start with Tarzan. We start with Esteban Miranda, who was the villain, uh, Tarzan's physical double, who was one of the villains in the previous novel, Tarzan and the Golden Lion. And he ended that book as a prisoner of cannibals. And he's still there uh, he's still there as their prisoner, chained up in a hut, uh, with an argument going on between the witch doctor and the chief of the village about whether he is Tarzan or whether he is a river devil with uh, possible supernatural powers. Um, of course, he's neither, but um, that the, the chief thinks he's Tarzan and the uh, witch doctor thinks he is a, uh, a river devil. To play on the fears of the witch doctor's young daughter, Uha, who is about 13 or 14 years old, um, convincing her he's really the river devil and getting her to release him. Uh, then he escapes into the jungle. He takes a bag of diamonds that he still had with him that were uh, that he had acquired in the last novel. And he takes Uha, little Uha as a hostage. Does not have a good time in this novel. I really feel bad for her because I liked her. 
She, you know, she had some gumption. She was fooled at first because of her superstitions. But later on, she realizes that he's not a river devil or Tarzan. She shows some courage in what she does. And she comes to a tragic end, which I think um, is really a very sad part of this novel. Uh, Tim, uh, just a reminder, when you turn your head, be sure to move the microphone with it. Okay, I will. Um, then we get to chapter two. Uh, and that switches back to Tarzan's African bungalow, where he is with Tarzan, uh, or he is with Korak, his son, and his daughter-in-law, Miriam. And they're also with Korak's little son, J uh, Jackie, who's a toddler at this point. Now, Tarzan has an airplane there, and he wants to go up on a solo fight, flight, uh, despite just having only just learned how to fly. Um, Korak and Miriam don't want him to fly alone, but he just says, I'm going to. And they can't stop him. And here we have one of like two major uh, failures of good judgment that Tarzan has during this, this novel. He starts flying solo. He goes over an area called the Great Thorn Forest, which uh, is an area surrounded by impenetrable huge thorn bushes. So nobody's ever seen the interior. He goes down to take a look and ends up crashing into a tree and knocking himself unconscious. Um, he's found by an Alalu woman, um, is just a, a primitive muscular woman. Uh, they don't have, this is a society that does not have a spoken language. They have, they speak in a kind of a primitive sign language. They don't have, even have names. Tarzan refers to this as the first woman, or, or Burroughs refers to this uh, character as the first woman who uh, lifts the unconscious Tarzan up takes her back, takes him back to her cave dwelling. Um, there's other similar um, uh, people there. There's also young children of both sexes, both females. Uh, females are armed with clubs. The males are all unarmed. Um, the first woman has to club this, a second woman to keep her from, to keep her from taking Tarzan away. Then a larger third woman kills both the first and the second woman. The third woman then takes uh, Tarzan captive to her cave, um, and the, the vultures outside are getting ready to, to eat on the, the, the two slain women. That brings us to chapter three. Um, some of the young in this village uh, examine the unconscious ape men, and one of them, a young boy, steals Tarzan's locket. That will be an important plot point later. Tarzan wakes up, he looks around, um, he tries to speak to them and realizes they don't have speech. They're just too primitive even for that. Um, they, they're, they're in the, the younger ones are indicated they're hungry, and a female points to Tarzan and um, just indicates that they should eat him. So one of the males actually shows a little bit of courage and steps up to Tarzan's side to try and protect him. Uh, the boy who had stolen the locket ends up getting killed. Star Tarzan has to defend himself against the, um, the, uh, the, the young females, and he eventually, when he has a chance, he makes a break for it. And getting out of the cave dwelling, he, um, the young man who tried, to, who tried to stand by him comes with him. Tarzan moves through the trees. They, get a, they escape their pursuit with the boy running along um, uh, on the ground underneath Tarzan. And that chapter ends with the, uh, the boy He's glad to be away, but it's nighttime, and there's terrifying sounds in the jungle all around him. Chapter four switches back to Esteban Miranda, who's wandering lost through the jungle. With him is still his Uha, who's realized that this guy is just nuts. He's not Tarzan. He's not a river devil. He's just an evil man who's currently holding her hostage. Um, then we switch to a vulture who comes down to eat, feast on some of the dead bodies back in the land, the land of the Lula, uh, Lula Alalu. And um, uh, he, uh, one of the vultures ends up with Tarzan's locket when they're eating the body of that boy wrapped around his neck. Um, and he's unable to get it out, get it off. So he flies off with the locket. Uh, meanwhile, in the jungle, Tarzan pulls the frightened boy up to safety just before a lion gets him. Tarzan gets to work making those usual weapons. You know, he finds the raw materials he needs to make a bow and arrow and so on. He kill, kills a deer, shares the, uh, shares the uh, meal with the boy. 
Um, and he decides to start making weapons for the boy as well and teaching him how to use it. So the, the boy before long is going to be um, pretty handy with a bow and arrow himself. And that is going to do a, do a lot to change a Lalu society. You know, he becomes, he feels less timid, becomes braver as time goes by. Uh, has it, as his skill, as the boy's hunting skill grows, he eventually goes off on his own. Um, finds, um, yeah, um, and so he's, he's off hunting on his own. Tarzan is, is on his own and he sees an Alalu female holding a little 18 inch tall man, a hostage with other small men trying to rescue the hostage. These are small warriors uh, with spears and swords riding, riding small antelope that we later learned were, are called diadets. So these are the ant men. Um, Tarzan tries to signal her to release the captive. He's learned the sign language by now. She refuses. So he kills her with an arrow and saves the life of the captive. And the captive is the prince of the local Ant-Man city. So the warriors, um, they bury their dead, they um, treat their wounded, and they bring Tarzan back to their city with him. Along the way, he does some more hunting, he kills a deer, he uses one of the rapiers of the warriors as a knife to cut off some meat and kind of grosses everybody out by eating it uncooked the way he usually does whenever he eats in front of somebody else. Uh, Hey, now that we've met the ant men, something we didn't mention earlier is that the ant men all have long, multisyllabic names. Tarzan uh, Burroughs actually just went to town, coming up with like six or seven syllable names for almost all of the characters here. Um, we are going to each individually, Scott, Jess, and I, as we as we discuss this novel, are going to just make our own decisions on whether to try and say those say say those names uh, completely or to use some sort of diminutive. Uh, there are no diminutives for these names used in the books. Everybody always uses the complete seven or eight syllable name every time they use it. Uh, but we may need to use diminutives rather than stumble over these names when we're discussing it. Or we may just say things like that guy or the king rather than try the names. So, um, so, so I do have to compliment the man who did the latest audio version because he just you know, is just his tongue rolls perfectly over every one of these names. Um, however many takes he must have done to get it right, he got it right. That audio uh, is from the Oasis company, is that correct? I believe it is, yes. And I apologize that I'm not remembering the name of the, re the reader right off uh, because he does a superb job. It's a, it is a fun audio book. So well, those are the Excuse me, I was going to say, regarding the names, I have to put in a plug here. The, the one name that I figured out how to pronounce, that I'm quite, prou I'm quite proud of, because I think it just rolls off the tongue. I can't say that yet for all the other names, but um, it is the king's son, Prince Komodo Florensal, is what I was calling Komodo Florensal, and it is, it, 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 I'm tr trying to use phonetics and, can't, and uh, pronouncing the name, um, and uh I cannot say that for all the other names, but the Kabota de Florence all sounds good to me. So um yeah, and I think they're all supposed to be pronounced phonetically. It's just there's so many syllables in each one, it's hard to do it without stumbling over them. The names are uh, bigger than the Ant Man, actually. They, they <laughs> are actually, yeah. So um, so um, yeah, you guys agree that Tarzan's very careless on his first solo fight. Um, I, you know, I mean, it's his own fault that he's here stuck in the great thorn forest, uh, <laughs> without any way of getting out because you know, he was told by Korak and, you know, just don't do this, take a co-pilot or just be really careful. And he flew low without thinking about it and brushed a tree and ended up crashing. So, um, I guess we get an example there of the Tarzan isn't perfect. He, he does mess up sometimes. Well, I think too, showing that he's fallible in that way, <clears throat> because um, it's not like the engine has trouble in the air mm -hmm. or he runs out of gas, which would be a bad thing to overlook. So it's nothing else that comes in. He says it's because he was circling and swoops in too, too low and mm -hmm. catches the side of a tree, which you know crashes the plane down. So it's his act of flying that causes it and trying to get in too close, some misjudgment. Yeah, um, I guess it's a reminder. Tarzan's good at so many things. It's a reminder that he does have to learn something that he doesn't know yet and sometimes needs practice. 
Well, I, I think, um, uh, Scott, were you done? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, it is necessary for Burroughs to remind his readers that Tarzan is human mm -hmm. and not not a Superman, um, close perhaps, but he's, I call him the world's best athlete, I'll say that. Um, that, that he is human and can make mistakes. We don't see it very often, but I would say that this is an, this turns out to be an error in judgment. And likewise, later on in the story, when he gets overwhelmed by the Ant-Man, another error in judgment. And furthermore, uh, and I, I'm not going to say this for sure, but my belief is, belief underlined, is that that plane belongs to Korok. I, I just checked the verbiage uh, in, in that chapter, and it does not come out and say that, but it does imply because uh, it does state that Korok had spent some time with some of the Wazari, uh, training them on uh, uh, on the uh, maintenance of the, of the plane, and that uh, Tarzan says something like, I'm a good student uh, on flying, or something to that effect. So I would say it's implied that the plane belongs to Korok, meaning that Tarzan is using someone else's property um, for a joyride. So that, yeah. all the more reason to be extra careful, again, uh -huh. And, uh, further proof that yeah, for once in his life, Tarzan has used poor judgment. Yeah, and it happens to everybody. And it's it's if you made Tarzan too perfect, he would stop being an interesting character. Oh, exactly. Yeah. There's then there's always that possibility he's going to goof uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 into the even the most powerful. Some rain must fall. Yep. Um, now, what do you guys think of the idea he in this chapter when he's talking about the Oahus who have a very dysfunctional society? There's no love. There's no tribal sense. There's no family sense. They, when they have when the females have children, when they're old enough to to possibly survive in the jungle, they're just thrown out into the jungle to survive on their own. Um, uh, he he presents the idea that before you can have love, you have to have respect, and that there's. Just, you know, in that the um in our societies, the man was the protector of the family, uh, which was true for centuries before we got civilized enough to be a little bit safer. And um that out of that protection came respect, and then out of that grew the concept of romantic love. Um, and I think he might have at least a little bit of a point there that he might have come up with a sound psychological reason why the Alalu culture is so dysfunctional. You don't have respect, so you can't have love. So you have no sense of tribal togetherness or family togetherness because of that. I think I think mutual respect is necessary for a relationship to be successful. There may be exceptions, but in general, I would certainly agree with you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure a Lalu culture would function very long in real life. Um, you know, it's just I think it would deteriorate and fall apart. And maybe it would have if we didn't have the cultural change we'll see it by the end of the novel. It'd have to unfold in, in eventually because he, he doesn't portray him as, as stupid, yeah. uh, but he doesn't portray him as having any type of relationship, even though, I mean, uh, women who are the strong people, yeah. you know, they're yeah. strong. The men aren't as strong. They're strong and, and um, it looks like must be smarter than the men because they're holding the power, but it's each person for themselves. The one woman kills the other woman and the other woman kills that woman to get, get the man. So they don't seem to have any respect or loyalty for what you would consider to be their family or tribal sisters. Yeah. Um, sooner or later, they extinguish themselves and be like a uh, nuclear war. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> not, they don't have the weapons, but uh, at some point they need that after grow, evolve, or else they're going to kill each other off i was going to say every woman for for herself yeah that's pretty much that's pretty much their <laughs> cultural attitude there um and in chapter five this is the only time in the the canon that i can think of that tarzan kills a woman um he's he's always been very reluctant to kill women um and um um even when you had female women villains um or female women villains female villains <laughs> Uh, you rarely, you know, they might meet their end, but it was never at Tarzan's hands. So I think this is the only time in the 24 original books that we see him killing a woman. Well, an example of, of Tarzan being faced with that very question is in the duology that you mentioned earlier of uh, Tarzan Untamed slash Tarzan the Terrible slash Tarzan the Golden Lion slash Tarzan the Ant-Man. Uh, and, and, and back in Tarzan the Untamed, 
Tarzan encounters Bertha Kirchner, who he feels is a, is a spy, and yet he refuses to kill her, even though he's tempted. He refuses to kill her because she's female, and it's a good <laughs> thing he doesn't, because come to find out, she's not not a spy for the Germans. Um, yeah, she's a British double agent. Exactly. So that, yes, that would have. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, so, also, real quick, while I have the floor, the uh, narrator on on the Oasis audio for uh, Tarzan the Ant-Man is Ben Dooley, who I agree okay. does a fine job. Ben Dooley. Yes, he does. Um, and I apologize for not knowing the name myself. Thank you for looking that up because uh, he deserves credit for doing an excellent job. Okay, well. I also wanted to point out uh, with chapter one, as opposed to the hero usually coming in, for those who had read Gold Lion, uh, Esteban shows up and it's like, oh, I know who this guy is. So we see that story unfolding and we know there's that regardless of what adventure Tarzan is going to start off with, their paths are going to cross somehow. And it just makes for, there are so many storylines and so much detail in, in 180 pages. And yet he keeps it flowing. Uh, you know, it's just a, a, a really a, a well-written book. I think one of his best. I th yeah, he really does provide a lot of detail on the lost world that we see. Um, in chapter six, um, he jumps back to the vulture, which, you know, he reminds us of, that, of the vulture that has Tarzan's locket around his neck, flying, approaching a dead buffalo to, to eat. Um, then he gives us a scene with Esteban and Uha still moving through the jungle together. Uh, and then he jumps back to Tarzan. Who, who very quickly learns the Ant-Man language. Um, he is, you know, he, he does have that facility for learning languages quickly. And um, that was so that Tarzan could throw him into a new lost world and have him learn the language quickly so he could get that out of the way and move on with the adventure. But he does learn languages very quickly uh, and he learns the Ant-Man language. Um, the list of how many languages Tarzan speaks, that would be interesting. <laughs> Um, cause I can think of at least three European languages, um, plus English, plus Latin from hold it, from Tarzan and the lost empire, plus Mangani. any number of lost worlds, Mangani. So that would be an interesting list. Assume, uh, there are 24 Tarzan books and I don't think we can say one language. I would hesitate to say one new language per book. I don't think that's an accurate statement, but it's pretty near close, which would say, I would guess around 20 different languages. Yeah. So he was, he was, um, you know, well, of course, we know that Tarzan is a genius level intellect. That Tar Burroughs um, establishes that one in the first one, first, very first book. So uh, the man he rescued from the Alalu female is the, the name you love, Jess, Komodo do Florencel, um, who I'm going to call Como through the rest of the book because I'm just not going to try that name. But he's, he's the son of the king. Um, the, the Burroughs in this chapter spends four pages describing the, um, the, the giant dome houses of the Ant-Man city. Um, and I'm not an architect or an engineer. The way he describes it sounds like it's practical, that you could build stuff. Like this. So he, at least as a lay person, he makes it sound good to me. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and the, there are 11 domes in the city with 500,000 citizens and another 500,000 slaves. He goes into the history of the Ant-Man. We find out that they are rivals with another city, the, uh, the city of Velto Pismacus. Uh, goes into the status of slaves, how they wear color-coded color um, uh, tunics to represent their status, with the green tunics being the, the lower slaves that work in the mines. Um, we find that to prevent inbreeding, which they had a problem with generations before, if you want to get married, you have to pick a captured female slave from an enemy city. So you would not marry a citizen of your own city. You would um, have to marry someone who was captured, uh, which must make their speed dating uh, events very interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, one thing that one thing that boggles my mind here is we're talking post World War One, early nineteen twenties, mm -hmm. five hundred thousand citizens and 500,000 slaves, a million people. There were not many cities in the world at that time with populations of a million. That's probably Nothing true. Like today, so that, 
This mm -hmm. is uh, just uh, the size of that society back then is incredible. It is. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, Tim, finish. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I think maybe he was thinking of the Romans a little when he like gave them such a high percentage of slaves, you know, as many slaves as there are citizens. Um, he's not basing the society directly on Rome, but I think he was influenced by Roman society where there were actually more slaves than free people. Mm -hmm. so. the, the, I was going to comment on, um, on Burroughs practice oftentimes, not every time, but oftentimes of having two lost cities generally opposing each other. We see that in, in several of the books. And, and to me, I find that very interesting. I think enhances the experience of the lost city because then you can compare and contrast. You've got two cities who are, who are generally opposing each other. Maybe one's on either end of the valley or something like that. And, and, and they're in a constant state of conflict. They, oh, they may have a truce and get together once a year like they do in Tarzan, uh, Lord of the Jungle. But uh, generally, there's there's some animosity between the two of them, and 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 then that gives you an opportunity though to compare um, the the people, their belief systems, or or how how they behave and things things that they that they do, and 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 you can see that sometimes they're not all that far apart. If they just get together and talk and hash out their differences, then they can work together. Um, but they it, sometimes it takes Tarzan to point that out to them. But I always find that fascinating. I think it's an effective way uh, to, to study uh, these worlds. Burroughs builds these wonderful worlds. So, and sometimes they only, usually they only exist for one book or even half a book. So might as well get as much out of them as we can. And I think having two cities there per permits an even closer examination. Go ahead. No, I think those are good points. I, I just Tarzan and the Lost Empire and City of Gold are just two other examples of mm -hmm. lost, lost land where there's opposing Versus Palu Don had some conflict going on there too. Yeah, they so, did. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. They did. yeah. So, okay. Well, we get to chapter seven. Um, Tarzan jumps back to the Alalu youth who had learned to use a bow and arrow. He's met a couple of older males of his own species. When they see him kill a woman with his bow and arrow, they just think, wow, that's epically cool. Teach us how to do this. So we see Alalu culture is about to get turned on its head. We, we can see that coming. I don't think Burroughs leaves that a secret at all. Uh, this this demonstrates that those uh, young fellows from the uh, 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 whatever you said. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 I the floor is all I can say, but I can't say <laughs> um, that. Those, that those young fellows, they're not entirely dumb. They've been beaten down. They lack confidence, but they do have some intelligence. They just need someone to work with them. Tarzan comes along. He's an instant instructor, instant father figure almost. Because mm -hmm. that young fellow does learn how to bow and arrow, and he starts teaching people. Yeah, uh, actually calling Tarzan a father figure to him, I think is very insightful. Uh, I don't think they actually meet again for the rest of the book, but he was obviously a father figure that moves this kid along from being just scared little guy <laughs> to actually being proactive and being able to fight back. Mm -hmm. They weren't so, going to get that kind of instruction from those warrior women. The, 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 warrior, the last thing the warrior women want is for those young guys to know how to fight, how, how, to, how, how to defend themselves. That's the last thing they want. They're not going to teach them something like that. They won't even teach them how to fish. Yeah, that's true. Um, so as we, as we move on with Chapter 7, we go back to Tarzan uh, with his allies in the, in the city of uh, Trohana Kamaka. Uh, they're being attacked by their enemy city. Uh, and Tarzan, because he's tall compared to the 18-inch Ant-Man, um, he sees the enemy coming. And he warns them, once again, earning more gratitude from the city. Um, and as they prepare for battle, and Tarzan goes in, Burroughs goes into quite a bit about their how they deploy their forces in an intelligent way. Uh, Tarzan tears a, a branch from a tree to use as a weapon. He's very self-confident here that um, he's not in any danger from these little guys at all. So what we're seeing here is his second, after crashing the airplane, his second serious lapse of judgment. Um, especially since he's going to be warned repeatedly that he probably needs to move back or climb into a tree or something that he is in danger. He just doesn't see that. I, I, I envision, I envision Tarzan saying everything's under control here. I'm not worried mm -hmm. about it. I, I can yeah. take care of myself. And he mm -hmm. keeps getting warned, as you just said, and he should have got a bigger branch is what he should have done. He uh, should at, have. The very least, at the very least, he should have gotten a bigger branch. Or as you suggested in an earlier discussion, is he should have just climbed a tree and thrown, and thrown a nuts at him or, or something. Yeah. It used to work when he was a kid against um, um, Sheeta the lioness. 
just climb yes, up exactly. and throw stuff at him. So, right. so we even had experience in this. Okay, so chapter, the battle's about to start, but as Burroughs often does, he at least briefly jumps away in the next chapter to another scene to keep the suspense high. In this case, it's um, that, that vulture that has Tarzan's locket around his neck is feeding on the dead buffalo, but he gets the locket uh, hung around the buffalo's horn and ends up strangling. So that locket has now been flown over the thorn bushes into the jungle and is sitting, uh, is wrapped around the, the neck of a now dead vulture. The, the, uh, and Burroughs teaches us lessons. Here's an example of one of the lessons Burroughs teaches us. When you're eating buffalo, be sure to remove your <laughs> Remove all your bling from yourself <laughs> exactly. before, before feasting on the buffalo. So another life lesson. Okay, so Tarzan's helping his friends in the fight against the enemy city, but um, you know he doesn't listen to the warnings. He's eventually overwhelmed. This is the scene that Joe Jusco uses to illustrate the cover of the new authorized edition. There's that brilliant, just like all those covers he's doing, you can't stop looking at them. They're just that good. And you can't, you know, you can't stop appreciating all the detail, um, how kinetic they are, how, how, how full of movement they are. Uh, they're just, it's amazing artwork. But uh, Tarzan getting overwhelmed by the enemy Ant-Man is what we see here. And he's eventually just sinks into unconsciousness. Uh, the chapter ends where we go back to Uha and Esteban as they're sleeping one night, or as Esteban's sleeping, Uha knocks him out and escapes into the night with the bag of diamonds. Uh, but as the chapter ends, she's being stalked by a lion. And this, this is where we get a bit of tragedy, because the next time we see her, she's just going to be a skeleton, <clears throat> does not get away. Um, and since we can't help but like her, you know, she's part of a cannibal village, but that's just where she grows up. She's, she's got spunk. She's smart. Uh, we were rooting for her and she's going to meet with a tragic end here. Um, I'm kind of glad that happened off screen. You know, um, she's being stalked by the lion and then later on her skeletons found. So, cause that would have been a pretty horrific scene to have her actually getting to describe her actually getting killed by the lion. But Casey but, Burroughs gives us a dose of reality. He does. He, he does know, he does know that it's a good idea to occasionally throw in some tragedy. Mm -hmm. um, and here we have a case of it. So chapter nine, Tarzan wakes up a prisoner of the enemy Ant-Man in a very large chamber lit by very two, two large candles. He's for quite a while, he's astounded at how all the Ant-Man became enlarged to his size <laughs> and how this huge city can exist. Um, it takes him forever to realize that he's been shrunk down, that they haven't gotten bigger. Um, and I don't want to be critical of him. It's such a bizarre situation. Um, we might not tumble to that either right away. But I think because when we're reading it, we realize right away as readers looking at it from the outside, we realize he's been shrunk. Um, it just gives the impression sometimes that Tarzan's a little slow on the uptake here. I don't think that's a fair evaluation, but it takes him several chapters to finally realize he's been shrunk down. Well, could he, and this would be according to how Burroughs describes the process, could, could he be a little groggy from whatever, from the after effects of whatever process went through him to shrink him down? Could be. And also, I think he takes a few days to heal from his wounds. So that's another fair point to make, that he's not at his best at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a bizarre situation. If we were in it, in that situation ourselves, rather than from the outside reading the prose, uh, we'd probably be equally slow on realizing what was happening because, you, you know, from your perspective, everybody just looks normal. You're not going to think, aha, I'm in a, um, a city of midgets and I've been shrunk down. That's not where your brain would normally go. <laughs> everybody, grew up over, everybody grew up overnight. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so, but, but, but then this is, oh, can we say that this is the third reminder in this book, the third reminder that we've counted this far, that Tarzan is indeed human and yeah. mistakes. Yeah, I, I think maybe we can. Um, he's given a green tunic, which is the lowest caste of slave, um, and he's taken to the king. And what Tarzan does here is he refuses, he doesn't talk, and he doesn't give any indication that he can understand their language. He does, because it's the same language as in the other city. But um, he lets them think that he must be related to the Oahu somehow, and that he's mute, that he doesn't have a, a spoken language. He meets Princess Janzara as well as the king, who, uh, you know, she's going to have an epiphany later now, right now, but right now she is a spoiled brat. Um, she gets mad at Tarzan for looking her in the eyes, 
and wants to buy him just so that she has the right to kill him afterwards. So uh, we don't have a good impression of Janzara right now. Uh, but um, um, we also hear, Tarzan doesn't hear this conversation, but the chief uh, scientist of the city, Gogo Loso, whispers to the king that he's reduced Tarzan in size. And he thinks that he, he's done this before with other creatures and they've always snapped back to their natural size. He thinks this time it'll last 39 moons, 39 months. Um, and Tarzan actually does spend some weeks that size before he grows back. But it's, it's fortunately for him, not 39 moons. It would have been interesting if he got back to his bungalow, still 18 inches high, and met, met Jane and Korak there. That would have been a, a hilarious scene. But he'll be back to normal by then. That'd be pretty tough to explain. But the other thing, that these, <laughs> the other thing that these ant people need to keep in mind, they need to run a keep a clock running on him because if this guesstimate, and I do say guesstimate, is when he's going to return his normal size, is anywhere near correct. They do not want him in one of their buildings when he starts expanding again. If he That's true. The building when he when he gets <laughs> back to his normal height, just yeah. just. By, getting bigger again simply getting bigger will destroy the entire building they don't want to lose those buildings that are smart right and also those buildings had tens of thousands of people in them so it wouldn't have been good for them either that's a lot of ant people to lose that's for sure oh and the and then the other thing i want to point out point out about about janzara there as, as you you know she's got a relatively short name compared mm -hmm. to all the other ant people and mm -hmm. I, I would submit that's because we will see more of her and uh burl's perhaps did not want to do so much typing in, in describing what she was <laughs> So you made her name short. That's a speculation on my part. That's not documented. Yes, that's true. Uh, a note on the buildings you're talking about too, because uh, another great thing about the ERB notes here, they do a comparison because uh, Burroughs made the, the domies in the buildings in 880 feet in diameter and 440 feet high. <clears throat> And they got a note over here saying the Superdome in uh, New Orleans has an outside diameter of 680 feet and is 273 feet high. So this is much bigger than the Superdome and normal sized people like us, I, I don't remember the number, but it holds a tremendous amount of people. So for people that are 18 inches high or thereabouts, and you got that much room, it could hold those large populations we were talking about. So yeah, we could true. have we could have two football games going on simultaneously on the Ant Man's domes. That's true. <laughs> this is a wonderful idea. <laughs> okay. Well, the red chapter. ants against. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um. Oh well, I could see them playing. Um, polo on those uh an those small antelope they ride that would be pretty cool looking. oh yeah so i think you're onto something there mm. that, that's a natural where they use the uh skulls of their enemies <laughs> that's true yeah um <laughs> reminds me of a scene from the movie the the man who would the man, man who would be king with um sean connery oh yeah uh, one of the tribes there is playing polo with their with the heads of their the, the of their enemies movie. yeah that is a great movie um Dr. Ken takes us to Esteban Miranda back. He wakes up from being knocked out by Uha, and he has amnesia. So he doesn't know who he is. He still has his physical movements aren't impaired in any way. It's just the amnesia. So he's now wandering around the jungle, talking to himself, not knowing who he is or where he needs to go. Uh, with the Tarzan, Princess Janzara is not allowed to buy Tarzan because he's a valuable experiment. Uh, Tarzan sent to the quarry, to the quarries to work there. Uh, and the, we do get a scene with the king's advisors where they're talking amongst themselves. And we learn that their king is kind of an incompetent fool who takes credit for other people's work and that there is not a stable political situation in this city. They've, they're, they're ruled by a tyrant who, um, who you know, decides to put people in charge of things that they're not qualified to be in charge of makes decisions on a whim. Uh, so it's not a well-run um, city because of that. As I um, recall, this king is described as a half-wit. Could he be an example of some of the dangers of this inbreeding that, that we were discussing? He might earlier, be. Going yeah, he, civilization? yeah, he might be. He might be some inbreeding going on there, and that's why he's not terribly bright. Because um, you were pointing yeah. out, uh, uh, maybe you haven't said it yet, but in our discussion, you were pointing out something like 
they've got some kind of a rule where they have to get the slave from the city next door? Um, yes, I think I did mention that. They were not allowed to marry their own citizens because they, yeah. they did have a problem with inbreeding in the past. Right. So, um, and it's along the way here that we start to see that using uh, that tar- Burroughs is using aspects of Ant-Man society to criticize income tax and prohibition. And unlike his uh, kind of satire on, on male and female earlier, I think these are, le- I think these, he's expressing what he concerns to be, what he considers legitimate criticisms. We see, um, Businesses in, in the Ant-Man society just barely going by because they have to throw so much money at the government. Um, and he's clearly paralleling that with the relatively new income tax. Um, he, you know, he was making good money in royalties at the time. He probably had to give a big chunk of that to the government and didn't care for it. Hmm. So um, um, and uh, uh, we also find out that this Ant-Man city has instituted a prohibition earlier on. He presents that as silly and presents it as hypocritical. Later on, they will find the guards who are guarding the wine cellars drunk because they've just been using their opportunity there to be to, to just dip into the booze that wasn't, you know, when they weren't legally allowed to. So um, Tarzan, you know, Burroughs is using this just like um Swift did with Gulliver's Travels. He's using this uh, city of little people to make some political and social comments. Um, he also does what uh, your four pages of the of one of the Ant Men discussing their philosophy of war and work, where they present war as uh, you know a potentially healthy thing for society, it keeps you strong and aware and disciplined and all of that. And I think it's a mistake to just say that Burroughs, that we automatically equate anything a character says to what Burroughs believed. Um, Jess, we were talking about this earlier. You pointed out that um, uh, later on in Burroughs' works, he did make remarks about how destructive and damaging yes. war could be. Yes. So, so, but here he's at least presenting an idea from the Ant-Man point of view that, you know, having an occasional war keeps you disciplined and focused and, um, and in shape. Um, uh, the, oh. He draws a he uh, this uh, Ant Man person draws an uh, I'll say an analogy that may not be the right word to pudding. Uh, uh-huh. it, some, you have bland pudding, but water makes the pudding more interesting. Essentially, that's what he's saying. I'm looking for the quote now, but, uh-huh. but you've, already, you've already captured it there. Yeah, and um, uh, we need to remember this is one of the bad guys saying this. Yeah, so, true. so that's I don't, I don't think we can equate this. Uh, you know, I think his criticisms of income tax and prohibition were sincere. I don't think we can equate these <coughs> remarks to what Burroughs necessarily believed. And and, and to your point, this um, this Ant Man, uh, who's one of the bad guys, is also a military leader. So he's got to sell people on the idea of war, so he can stay in business. Is what that's true. Is. That's true too. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the Burroughs' concerns about war, as a reference point, I would say are expre- best expressed, and there may be other places, uh, best expressed in um, Beyond the Father's Star. That's that's an example of it. And granted, this is later in his life. Certainly, if in the case of World War One, World War Two, Burroughs was very much in favor of, of the United States taking an active role there, and even went so far as to become a war correspondent so he could be involved in it too. Yeah. But you can also realize how horrible war was, but still think, well, we need to beat the Nazis. That's unavoidable. So, so yeah. Um, okay. Any other comments on these chapters? Um, I think we've actually commented on most of the things I, I we had notes on um, as we were going. Well, you haven't seen so, my notes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm good. For, I'm good for right now. Please go right ahead. Okay. Well, moving on to chapter eleven. Um, Tarzan's taken to the quarries of the enemy city. Uh, to, they're constructing a new dome there. Um, they still think he can't talk, and they give him the name Zoanthral, which means the giant. Um, he's working under a specific um, um, officer, and he meets a beautiful slave girl named uh, Talaskar, and he does speak to her, you know, revealing that he knows the language. Um, he's from the friendly city, the city that he was first at, but she was born underground as a slave, um, and her mother didn't report her existence or report her birth. So nobody knows about her existence. She just kind of hangs out there, but she's never been outside. She's never been out of the, out of the mines. Uh, and a slave, another slave makes advances on her unwanted advances. Tarzan, uh, intervenes and this other slave charges him. There's about to be a fight. 
but that's the end of the chapter. And so we switch to another scene as usual. He's ending the chapter in a cliffhanger, but making us wait a while before he resolves that cliffhanger. Um, he goes back to the Alalu, where um, the, the, that young, one young man uh, has now got 10 other men armed. Um, they drive away one of the women. A group of angry women go out looking for them to teach them a lesson. Uh, so there's a battle coming up. But then we switch back to Tarzan, who's punching out that, that slave who had, who had made um, advances on um, uh, Talaskar. Um, he really does. He gives us much easier female names. Janzara and Talaskar, you can say those names without stumbling over them. Um, the officer in charge uh, tells, you know, tells Tarzan he's going to receive 100 lashes. Um, you know, Talaskar intervenes. But you know, now this officer wants to buy her. Um, and Tarzan also discovers that Komodo Florensal, uh, who I'm just going to call Como, the prince of the other city, is also said, a prisoner. You said it so well. I did? <laughs> <laughs> um, he's using a secret identity. Nobody knows he's the prince. Um, he's the other man that Talaskar cooks for. Um, and this is where Tarzan finally learns he's been shrunk down. Como tells him this. Um, so, so he finally gets it. The process is done by um, a local scientist who can make men smaller, but not larger. He has to just hope that, the, that it eventually um, uh, wears off on its own. Um, he also explains, it's kind of interesting, the little details that Burroughs thinks of and explains. The candles here consume carbon dioxide and release oxygen, which is why they can have these huge candles underground without it eating up all the oxygen, which is kind of another nice little um, a touch. So chapter 13, Tarzan tells Como, I'll try it, Komodo do Florensal, that, that when they make, uh, you know, when they try to escape, they have to take Talaskar with, with, with them. You know, he's befriended Talaskar and he's not going to, um, leave a friend behind. That's just a typically Tarzan thing to do. Um, Tarzan come up with kind of a little con job where uh, Como can pretends he can talk to Tarzan in a, another language. They just talk gibberish to each other. And then Como comes up with whatever translation he, he wants in order to try and fool them. Um, we find out the king wants to see Tarzan. Um, we get to chapter 14, we have back to the Alalu, 50 women are setting out to, to punish the, the disobedient males, but they're driven back uh, by the bows and arrows. They can't stand against the superior weaponry. And a few are captured and kept to cook for the men. So the tables are turned on these women completely. It's totally upended their society. Um, meanwhile, you know, Tarzan has been brought before the king he gets to, he he's taken to the lab where they have the um, the scientists equipment for um, for uh, reducing things. Um, and Tarzan is listening. They remember they think he's mute and can't understand. He actually memorizes the settings of the machine, hoping he can somehow reverse the process himself. And it's kind of interesting. The the uh, ERB list summary points out that. That's a plot thread that's never fought, never followed up on. He never does get a chance to use this equipment. It makes sense that he would memorize those settings just in case, but in the end, he just escapes without getting re-enlarged, and it just wears off on the effect. Just wears off on its own. Well, now it is possible. It is possible that there was something in the pulp version of the story which was not retained when the uh, book version of the story was released. Oftentimes those, those stories went through editing. Uh, Burroughs generally would do the editing himself some fine tuning. And it's possible that something might have been removed there by, by Burroughs himself, which might have been where, where this was employed. I'm speculating when I say that. Um, I have not researched that. Uh, just tossing it out as an idea. It's possible. It also just might be, um, you know, uh, Burroughs wanted to continue with his world building and show the actual lab where this was done. 
And it just made mm-hmm. so much sense for Tarzan to memorize the settings just in case well, for, yeah. that 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 yeah. Burroughs left it in, even though he was, he knew he wasn't going to use it later later in the story. For contingency planning, I think it's a wonderful idea. You never know yeah. when that kind of info and mm-hmm. building might be necessary. Yep. Now, chapter 15, as Tarzan and Como put in a small dome in the uh, small chamber in the king's dome, and they eventually uh, um, you know, Tarzan realizes that he's still got he's like kind of like super strong when he's shrunk down he still has his normal uh, full-size strength he's able to rip some bars out of a window they use that to form hooks and they climb down a central shaft uh um to another room and they enter a room with the chapter ending uh they come into a room where they find a whole lot of men lying in what appears to be pools of blood and that brings us to the end of chapter 15 um any comments from you guys on this? Tarzan was the original Adam. He was. Yes. Wasn't he? Yeah. Retain, yeah. retain the power and strength uh in a small size like that. That's true. That is so good. Adam Ant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that's exactly what happens when the Adam shrinks himself down. He can control his keep his normal weight and strength if he sets his little belt controls properly. Yeah. So Great I point. just I wonder. Uh, I can't remember who was it was Gardner Fox, whoever wrote the first Adam story. I wonder mm. if he if he picked up on that from a Tarzan novel he'd read once. It would well, be surprising yeah. since Fox wrote pulp novels too. Yeah, is, that's he, had to, he had to have been a Burroughs reader. Yeah, this is the third time Gardner Fox has come up in my conversations this week. Kid you not. And I'm <laughs> I grew up reading a lot of those DC comics. Some old mm. DC comics fans I've often stated. And Gardner Fox is certainly one of my favorites. And I don't recall offhand if he was involved in Adam, but he might have been. Be that as it may, to, to, uh, he might have been, Scott. To your point, Tim, um, that, that could, I think that could, could be a real possibility that uh, that whole notion came, came from the Burroughs stories. There's a lot, a lot of things came from the Burroughs stories that wound up in, yeah. in other words. <laughs> yeah, and if we're remembering incorrectly, that was Gardner Fox who wrote the first Adam story. You know, somebody listening is going to know that. They can send us an email and let us know we were wrong. But most definitely, Gardner Fox was a writer and executive at DC Comics. Mm-hmm. And he, he certainly worked on the Flash comics, no question yeah. about that. Oh, yeah, he created the whole concept of the multiverse for DC Exactly, comics. he did. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Flash of Two Worlds with Jay Garrick. Yep. That's exactly mm-hmm. right. Remember it well. So I've got uh, quite a few of his paperbacks, which are like Conan, Sword and Sorcery start style. Books too. I have had those on my Kindle for some time. I have not read them yet. I keep meaning to. I, I think one, one of the titles, one easy reading. I mean, they're, they're good reads. If, as I recall, and I don't know the details, but one of the titles is Laren, L A I R N. Does that sound familiar? Uh, yeah. Matter. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to look it up. Uh, don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Well, Lothar all this, or something like that. I can't remember yeah. now. Um, so, yeah, so in this, with this that, that's covering chapters 11 through 15. So we see the Olalu Society starting to get upended. And Tarzan and Como are finally making a break for it. Um, so chapter 16, they discover the men are not drunk and lying, are not dead and lying in pools of blood, but they're drunk and lying in pools of wine. <laughs> Um, so this is this is where we get the overt criticism and hypocrisy that Burroughs saw in Prohibition, um, you know, because it didn't stop anybody from drinking; it just stopped them from right. drinking legally. So, um, so I think this is a direct uh, um, a direct criticism of Prohibition here. And as with his criticism of income tax, I think it was sincere. It wasn't just satire like he was doing earlier, but he was really saying that this is a bad law; we need to change it. And of course, prohibition would be eventually done away with less than a decade later. We're still living with the income tax, though, and probably a lot of people can argue about whether that's a good or bad thing. So, um, so a couple more men open, uh, enter the room. They're killed by Como and Tarzan. Um, Tarzan just like uses the iron bar he has to, to crush the soul. Do find out though that Tarzan, uh, I can't remember if it's in this chapter or not. We do find out that Tarzan is quite skilled with a sword because he was trained by Paul Darno in fencing. 
So I think um, it was in 16, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Tarzan's not just picking up a weapon he's not familiar with. He's he's had somebody who was a fencing expert show him how to use this thing. So they are they take the um the uniforms of the men they have killed. Um they dress the two dead men in their own slave tunics and drop them down the shaft, uh, also dropping down the hooks they were using to climb. So it looks like it might look like they were killed trying to escape and give them some time. Um, they find a place to, to stay until daybreak. Um, they, so they can go out to the city because they're dressed in military uniforms now. And they, um, this is where we get like the really overt criticism of income tax because they stop at a shop for breakfast and the owner spends quite some time talking about how his business is being crushed because he has to give so much money to the government. They do hear as the chapter ends that the uh, that the the bodies they left behind were found and were taken for the them as escaping slaves. So for the moment, nobody knows they're still alive and free. In chapter 17, they head back to the quarry to rescue Talascar. Um, a guard recognizes them and traps Como, but you know, this is where we find Tarzan knows how to fence. He, um, you know, this is where Paul Darno is actually mentioned in this chapter. Yeah, I had it marked yep. wrong. I thought it was yep. 16, but so. yeah. Um, so, but they discover that Talaskar is taken away by the head guard who wanted to buy her. So they got to go to his uh, quarters. Um, they bribe a guard to find out where it is. And um, Tarzan, um, <coughs> uh, Tarzan uh, goes to, they go to these quarters and they overhear a discussion while they were there where they find out someone recognized them in the quarry. So they're now being actively searched for. Um, the, the evil officer, uh, Kyle Fastabon, that's actually not too bad. Too Looks bad. good to me. Uh, he tries to kill, to kiss Talisgar. Tarzan, um, you, uh, you know, Como kills him. Tarzan strangles another bad guy to death. Karathatab. Uh, yeah, Karathatab, that's the slave who betrayed them. Uh, they escape through a trap door in the floor. Um, they, uh, you, know, you know, so they find, let's see, they find like some, an ancient body there that crumbles into dust. And Como tells Tarzan about an ancient battle between the ant man and real ants. It would have been a cool novel in of itself. Yeah. Uh, it's a great little story. Uh, and then they hear a human voice. Um, we switch back in chapter 19. We switch to Korak has been searching with the Wazaris, have been searching all over for Tarzan, not finding him anywhere. And we go back to Tarzan. The um, you know, he and Como and Talaskar find a secret passage and they come to a room with Princess Janzara in it. And um they capture the Tars, they capture the princess who wants to go with them willingly and says, tells Tarzan that um that, you know, um, he says, Tarzan, I love you. You know, Tarzan replies that he loves another. And there's some confusion here that'll take a few chapters to get worked out because um, Como thinks Tarzan loves Talaskar. He just says, I love another. He doesn't say, I love my wife, Jane, back in, you know, the real world. So Como thinks he loves Talaskar, uh, whereas Como's falling for Talaskar himself. Um, and the princess doesn't like being rejected, so she sends, she pulls, she does the trapdoor trick and sends Tarzan down a chute um, where he finds himself facing what are two ordinary African wildcats, but compared to him now, they're the size of lions. Um, so Como jumps down the chute after him to help fight off the lions, and Jenzera and Talaskar fight. Um, back up in the room until they both fall down the chute. Um, so we've got a yeah. cat fight on two floors. Yeah. Yeah. We got a cat. <laughs> Ouch. That was brilliant. Okay. Um, so there's a man in a chamber there. It turns out to be Zoan Throhaga, the scientist who had shrunk down Tarzan and who loves the princess. Um, they come out, he, he comes out to help. Uh, fight the cats. This is a great fight scene. I love this fight scene. I mean, Tar Burroughs always does great fight scenes. They're always exciting and well written, and they unfold in a logical manner. This is just this was one of my favorites when I was um, experiencing again through the audiobooks. It's really a great fight scene. 
but they, they fight off the cats and get away. Um, the princess is now she's had her epiphany. She realizes she was wrong. Um, and he, you know, she, she says, yes, I love the scientist. Como learns that Tarzan doesn't love Talaskar, which is good because he loves her. So all the romance stuff is resolved at this point. Um, and he's going to, if Como is going to marry Talaskar, even though uh, he's a prince and she's only a slave girl, um, they, they, um, the princess is able to serve, to provide them with the di with six diadets, the the uh, small antelopes that they use for riding beasts, and they ride out uh, they ride out of the city. They man they run down a sentry and they head for the hills. Uh, they travel all day and all night. They sleep in a hole of a of a small rat uh, or a small badger, and um, they. They, you know, get into that hole just ahead of a lion that was trying to catch them. And chapter 20, that moved the story along quite a bit. So that was um, a full size, excuse me, that was a full size. Full size lion. lion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do think I, we've already mentioned it is a nice touch that we learned that Tarzan had learned swordplay from Paul Darno. It just makes perfect sense. And it's a reasonable, a reasonable justification for Tarzan being good in a fencing match. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, I spent so much time with him, and, and Darnett was a uh, officer, and yeah, so he would know that stuff. He would, yeah. That would have just been his culture at the time, would have been learning how to sword fight. Um, and this whole sequence, I've already mentioned how much I love the, the fight scene with the cats, but their whole escape sequence is really very exciting. Um, it's, just, it's just, well, a long action sequence at this point, and it's really well done. Um, I was going to ask if you guys think if Jinzera's change of heart, you know, from trying to kill Tarzan just a few minutes before to becoming their ally, uh, did, did that seem abrupt or did you guys believe it? Um, I have to say, I, abrupt. I, I, yeah, I have to say Tarzan, you know, Burroughs is actually very good at characterization. He doesn't get enough credit for that. Here's a case where he had to move the story along. And I think Jinzera's repentance and epiphany happens a little too quickly. Yeah. Um, um, I know he had to get it in in order to just move the story quickly. Um, but if, if it's just one of my rare criticisms of a Burroughs novel is I just think he didn't quite make John Zara's change of heart completely believable to me. Earlier when she didn't like the fact he's staring in her eye or, you know, eyes and stuff. If he had had just a couple of sentences about a strange, it was a feeling she had. Mm -hmm had with any of her ant men before or whatever you know <laughs> uh, that's strange or yada 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 and uh that might have set up the thing that there were stirrings yeah uh, we didn't know about but mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh my two cents on that first of all you posed a good question uh, uh all readers expect things and rightfully so expect things to be plausible um uh, i really I did not have a problem uh, with her change of heart because I think she's a desperate person. She sees an opportunity that a once in a lifetime opportunity to find a new a new life, and uh, maybe this is uh, maybe that's what she really wants down deep inside. And to be that fair, too, I think that makes sense. Also, to be fair, she'd probably never been in serious physical danger before, and then she drops down that chute, and the wildcats are there, and um a near-death experience can also be something that makes you rethink your life oh yeah so 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 yeah i don't want to be completely unfair i i think it might have been better if he foreshadowed it a little more but um, um you can also justify it um so um any other comments on that uh no not for me Okay, well, the last couple of chapters uh, takes them about a week to get back to their home city. Um, they are chased by, um, by people from the enemy city who just yelling to the princess that she'll be pardoned if she returns, but she says never. You know, she's going to go off with Zo Zoanthrahaga, the, the uh, scientist guy, and they're going to live in the other city. Um, they are... Um, they're captured... Let's see, they ride into the forest... Um, they're captured by a, uh, the, the Alalu women, um, but they turn out to be, um, how does this work? I've almost forgotten it. I'm sorry. 
they, they find some of the women, but the women are now subject to the men. Um, mm-hmm. They're beaten and mistreated, but they love it. We talked about this earlier. I really that, think this that is society is flip flopped. I would yes, say yes, it's yeah. flip flopped, and he might be putting in some poetic justice here. But I really do think we talked about it earlier. I really don't think this was his views of a healthy relationship, Burroughs' views of a healthy relationship, or mm-hmm. patriarchy, or anything like that, because he's just what. Well, yeah, like I said, you can't imagine Tarzan ever mistreating Jane either physically or emotionally. No. You know, so he knew what a healthy relationship consisted of. Um, so they finally, you know, they finally make it back to their, their home city. Uh, Tarzan's made a prince. Um, the, the princess and the scientist are given their liberty. Uh, Talaskar, of course, turns out to be the daughter of a princess. So there's no problem with her marrying Como. Um, you know, that's very convenient. And uh, Tarzan waits a while. He doesn't grow any larger after some weeks pass. So he decides to just head home on his own and hoping he'll go to normal size on the way. And that actually is a good decision because he has time to crawl through the thorn trees while he's still small enough to do it, getting to the other side out of the great thorn forest before he falls down and unconscious to the ground. Which Um, makes you wonder what kept those ant men from doing the same thing and going out and exploring the world. That's actually true. Yes, Uh, they could have at any time. Um, So, yeah, I hadn't thought of that at all. It's a good point. Now, maybe the, the opposing city might have kept them kept them from wandering around so they could always be at home so they could defend. Maybe that's the reason. Could be. You don't want to spare a whole bunch of your military assets exploring right. outside when you right. have to defend, you know, when you have to do, even if you're not being attacked, you have to do raids of your own sometimes to get fresh slaves. So, um, so yeah, it, that can make sense from that point of view. But I will say these ant guys, if they had tried to go beyond and bumped into those warrior women, those ant guys would have given the warrior women a, a fight, a bigger fight than the, than the warrior women <laughs> would have. That's true. Yeah. I think they could have overwhelmed them because there was tens yeah. of thousands of them. They could have overwhelmed the lot of eventually. Right. Um, so the last chapter uh, has a Wazari warrior named, a Wazari warrior named Usala finds the, you know, they're looking for Tarzan. Uh, they search the cannibal village where uh, Miranda had been a prisoner. They find that he finds the bones of, the, of Uha confirming her death, uh, which is just a very sad moment, and uh, he finds the bag of diamonds. Um, later, they find Esteban uh, eating a buffalo, and he's found that locket, you know, so he's, he, he looks like Tarzan and he's wearing the locket, so Usala thinks he is Tarzan and that he's you know, somehow gone insane. So he brings him home to the Greystoke bungalow. The dogs won't go near him. So neither will Jad, Jad Balja, the golden lion, which should have been a clue. Um, but, you know, by now, Esteban is physically uh, weak and thin and sickly. So they can't tell, Korak and Jane can't tell whether he's Tarzan or not. They're not sure because... Maybe it's Tarzan who's just gone through this horrible physical experience. He probably needs to shave a haircut and a bath also. He probably does, yeah. Um, but it's Flora Hawks who knew Miranda. She was she worked, she was a character who worked with the villains in Golden Lion, but eventually uh had a change of heart. And that novel ended with her with her asking to be uh, uh Jane's servant, her maid. Mm-hmm. And they forgave her for what she did and she became a servant. Um, I think I remember when we did a golden lion a year or two ago that I said that she never popped up again. And I was wrong. She does pop up briefly here. She recognizes him as, as Esteban. And she says, Nope, that's not Tarzan. That's that jerk Esteban. Um, and in the meantime, Tarzan has been briefly captured by the, uh, by the cannibals, but he breaks his bonds, makes a getaway. Um, gets home at that moment flora is saying esteban's not tarzan and tarzan walks in the door and says no he's not i'm you know here i am so uh jane wonders how she could have been mistaken and hugs and kisses him and we don't see jane for eight novels after that but at least she has a like a nice time with her husband before that so oh, that tarzan said if you thought that was really me you don't know me i'm going <laughs> <laughs> that might explain yeah blew it jane 
Uh, <laughs> but um, no, they were still doing great together in Tarzan yeah. Quest, which is also an epic. Jane can really handle herself in the jungle uh, book too. So um, <laughs> we haven't, excuse me, we haven't talked about Tarzan's Quest, have we? We have not. That might be. Well, do we want to do that next? Well, I don't uh, know if I, I don't know if I want to say next, but I would like to do it soon. That's a favorite yeah, of mine. That is a fun one. I'd be good a, with it. Yeah, um, and there's that whole immortality pill thing, which is a fascinating subject. And the, it is the Kavuru drugs or elixir. Yeah, elixir is the right word. Mm -hmm. um, so this ties up all the plot threads that started with Tarzan and the Untamed um, several books before are now tied up. What do you um, call it? Quadology, we call quadology, it. Quadology, I think. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, it's a great ending to the book with Tarzan's triumphant return at just the right dramatic moment. Um, and uh, at this point, um, you know, I don't think, I don't know if at this point Tarzan and Jane had achieved functional immortality because we're told about that in a flashback later on. So um, I think when we were talking earlier, I said, you know, if you're going to be immortal, maybe sometimes you need a break from your mate. You know, after 300 years, you just need a oh. week for your, you know, so, so yeah, you know, this is the point where we don't see Jane much anymore, except for Tarzan's quest. She's right. sometimes not even mentioned throughout the course of the book. So this is where Tarzan just starts wandering around the jungle, stumbling over, you know, goes behind a bush to relieve himself and stumbles over just another lost civilization. <laughs> and, um, um, and just has adventures on his own. Um, so yeah, this is a change of kind of a format with the book starting at this point. Um, so this, this was book number 10. Um, yes, yeah, book man. Number 10. Yeah. so, yeah. so you can divide the jar you can kind of divide the Tarzan saga up between the first 10 books and then just random individual adventures, um, from book 11 through 24. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're all fun, excellent books. I, I mentioned earlier that Tarzan and the Lost Empire is one of my favorites. Um, but um, there is a different feel to the later ones where he just, where Burroughs just set Jane aside as a character and concentrated on, on um, Tarzan. And just as you mentioned, you always had that co-hero almost all the time who could have the romance. Um, so the books kind of went in a different direction, an equally entertaining one, but... Um, he kind of just, you know, changed the format a little bit at that point. Maybe, maybe when he was small, he realized how big the world really is and got to regular size and realized the world <laughs> is still a big place to explore. Yeah, I got to look around. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Jane, I'm going off into the jungle for three months. Do you want me to get some milk or something on the way back? <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> i'll stop by burger king on the way yeah home. i'll stop yeah yeah don't worry <laughs> about dinner i'll just kill a buffalo and uh, <laughs> um so but they they because we do know they stayed happily married um yeah. they just made it work and jess i like your theory that jane was handling the business end um mm -hmm. because that just makes sense to me and she's obviously more than capable of doing that um so that's that's just a cool idea but um, I'm sure she missed Tarzan when he was gone, but she just realized he needs his jungle to be him. And then, um, then the other activity I think is quite plausible for Jane is that uh, she had some uh, training and education in uh, probably archaeology or anthropology, one of those fields. And she could have been off having her. I really think it's very possible she's off having her own adventures. I know she wasn't growing flowers all those years that much. Yeah, <laughs> she, she was doing something. Yeah, it shows how their relationship evolved because in Son of Tarzan, she was making him live in London and saying, "We're not even going to talk about True. Africa to our son." True. You know, she eventually came to realize that that was wrong. In order to be a good <laughs> wife to her husband, she had to let him be him. After the uh, sun ran off to the jungle at the back. Right. And because yeah, so that didn't that didn't work out the way she planned anyway. It's like we won't even mention the jungle. Oops, he's gone off and become a proto-Tarzan. Okay. Never mind. I love that book. Yeah, it is a great book. Um, that's the one that introduces the whole chronology problem that drives people nuts. But yeah. sometimes you just gotta go with stuff like that. So um, so okay, so that is Tarzan and the Ant Man. Um just, just a wonderful book. I had not revisited this one in years. Um, so I was glad to read it again or listen to it again in this case. And I do recommend the new audiobook for anyone who wants to experience it. Um, and 
any last comments from you guys about the book? Just enjoyed it. another great discussion with you guys. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it was fun. It's always fun. So um, yeah, I think I gave away a few minutes ago when we were talking about Tarzan's quest that we have not decided on what we're gonna do next. Um, I do want to apologize for those people listening to these podcasts in 2022. We went an awful long time with no new content. And that was because I had some medical issues during the summer and I'm all completely recovered now. But um, we, we, we didn't do any new full length episodes for some months. And I didn't even do the little mini episodes I like to do to keep content coming in between our full length ones. And that was the fault of my gallbladder. So blame it on, 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 a, on an organ that betrayed me. So um, all of it all. The, yes, the gall of it all, the gall of my gallbladder. So, but we should be more regular now. Um, we, I will be start doing mini podcasts again. I was thinking of covering Treasure Island, which I know was in Burroughs' library. So may have been an influence on him, but as part of just talking about other adventure books that were, that were out um, concurrent with Burroughs or that may have been an influence on him. Uh, so I'm thinking of doing um, um, uh, Treasure Island next. So keep an ear out for that. Um, if you're listening to this in the far future, you know whether or not I've accomplished that goal. Um, and that's it for now. Um, well, well, now, uh, excuse me, hold on there. I, mm -hmm. said, I said earlier you had not seen my notes. I still have a couple of points to cover here. Hey, I'm sorry, Jeff. <laughs> I was jumping too soon. Uh, okay. I didn't want to interrupt it. You were both on a roll. I didn't want to interrupt He's, he's going to ante it up. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll run through these fairly quick. If you want to explore them further, that, that's up to you all. Mm -hmm. But uh, at least I want to get them on the table so we can say that, well, that was brought up in our discussion in case anybody asked. Mm -hmm. uh, needless to say that uh, Jonathan Swift's Gull Gulliver's Travels was uh, some influence on Burl's development of this. And, and I, th I think it's, and I'm assuming when I say this, but, I, but it's not unusual that uh, you see something another writer does, you say, gee whiz, how would my character handle a situation like that? So I, I think it's, I'm speculating when I say this, but I think it's very possible that Tarzan or Burroughs might have said, what would Tarzan do? Uh, one of my favorite questions, how would Tarzan handle this? Um, and, and, and hence uh, Tarzan and the Ant-Man. I, I do want to point out that, um, and this came up uh, earlier off camera, I think, um, uh, Burroughs Ant-Man were about 18 inches tall. Gulliver's uh, small warriors are about six inches tall. So there is a difference there. But the Gulliver's people do revel in displays of authority and performances of power. And considering their size, that may be a necessary precaution. So, but my point is, they had a warlike attitude to things. Hence, um, the Ant Man that we saw here in the Burl story also has a, has a warlike attitude. I would say, and it, it, maybe it's necessary. Well, but two opposing cities, as we stated, that that uh, that might be hard to avoid. Um, Another thing I wanted to put a plug in here for in the Russ Manning Tarzan Sunday strips, comic strips, which are available at erbzine.com. And that feature in my discussion group for Love of All Things Edgar Rice Burroughs periodically. I'm running them right now. Uh, there's a Tarzan does have occasion to return to visit the Ant Men. And this time he brings back a friend with him, Joyper, who stands about 18 inches tall. He's an ant man. He comes with Tarzan and and and, and shares some of those adventures that Tarzan has in the in the Russ Manning uh, comic strips, uh, Sunday mm -hmm. comic strips. And I would say uh, Joyper is a is a perfect example of what we see out of these ant man warriors. He's a talented, skilled swordsman. He is fearless. He charges ahead with his sword point at the ready. He doesn't care how big his opponent is. He's going to go do some damage. Joyper is a lovable character that um, is, is to, to be admired as, uh, I would say, a, a great warrior and, and a, a good a good sidekick for Tarzan. Go ahead. He also has a two-syllable name, which I suspect was so that Manning or whoever did the lettering of Manning's strip didn't have to write um, – Six or seven <laughs> syllables every time they mention his name. Probably one. <laughs> <wanted to> <laughs> Point made. Point mm -hmm. made. Um, oh, oh uh, Tarzan the Ant Man is mentioned in To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, Scout, the young lady who's uh, one of the key characters in that Harper Lee story, uh, mentions just one sentence mentions that she was reading Tarzan the Ant Man. So I'll be sure and pl unplug that favorite yeah, story. And and Scout was based on Harper Lee, the author of the story. Yes. So yeah. I suspect that Harper Lee probably read that one and remembered it fondly when she wrote the book um, decades later. Sounds plausible to and, me. And uh, 
um, I can't remember his name now. Uh, a guy who becomes a summer friend of her and her brother Jim. Uh, Dill. He's based on yeah. Dill. Dill. Yeah. He was. He he's, was Truman he's Capote. Based on Truman Capote, who was her real life friend when they were kids. Oh. The same thing. Good point. Good point. Um, Gold Key Comics years ago um, uh, did an adaptation of Tarzan and the Ant Man issues number one seventy four, one seventy five. For those who want to. Uh, Get yeah, yeah, another take on this on this story. It's Gold Key Comics issues 174, 175 from their Tarzan series. Uh, we talked about Tarzan underestimating his opponents and 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 not you know, exercising some poor judgment here. And that's all the comments that I have. So that okay. wasn't too bad, was it? <laughs> yeah. Now I need to I need to see if I can find and read the Gold Key adaptation. I would suspect they probably leave out some of the subplots in that and concentrate just on oh. the Ant-Man story in order to fit it into two issues. Uh, it uh, is condensed, no question about mm -hmm. it. That's available at erbzine.com. I'll have to look at that. I can get yeah. you the link if you need to find it. Oh, I can find it. I Yeah, I, I, I know how to go. So I appreciate that because um, I, I imagine they minimize the Alalu and probably some of the political satire and just tell the straight adventure story. Yeah, um, right. I don't recall. Uh, it, it's, it's condensed, no question about it. Yeah. Exactly how they did it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they. Um, well, Gold Key did excellent stuff. Um, yes. Their their adaptation. I think it was Doug Wildly doing the artwork with their adaptation of Tarzan at the Earth's Core, which I believe was three issues. Yes, it was. Um, That's exactly it's, the only one. It's quite excellent. Issues. Yeah, and it was very faithful. Um, going that extra issue meant they didn't have to condense very much, right. and just just a wonderful read in its own right. Exactly. Um, so so I'm looking forward to looking up and reading the Ant Man one. So I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, so any other comments? No, that, I'm done. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, this has been a great discussion. Um, and as I was mentioning, I don't think we haven't decided what we'll be doing next yet. So we'll announce that soon. And I'll be doing those mini podcasts, hopefully in the meantime, uh, providing I don't have another organ fail and I don't expect that to happen. Um, so uh, we will talk to you all again soon. Once again, my name is Tim DeForest. Uh, please visit my blog at Comics, Old Time Radio, and Other Cool Stuff. Feel free to click on the links there to find my books on Amazon and buy them. Um, you guys want to plug anything before we go? And thank ERB Inc. for the fact we get to do this and, mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, allowances they've given us in uh, this uh, ERB store and stuff. Yes, and I should mention our store. There'll be a link to our store in the show notes where you can buy merchandise with images uh, created by the artist Ben Alvarez. Um, and uh, we haven't, frankly, we haven't had very many people visit the store yet. I think we're the only ones who have bought materials there. So please look at our store. We've got some great stuff there. Um, Everyone needs a Griff coffee cup. I tell yes. you, this, your life yeah. is not complete unless you have a Griff coffee cup. Because mm -hmm. there's a Griff out there that loves you. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and you need to show show that Griff some love and get you a Griff yes. coffee cup, and we are the only outlet for that. Yep, or a Woola short shot glass, you know. So there's all sorts of opportunities for these images on all sorts of different merchandise. So please visit our store. Where, where uh, about can that store be found, Tim? What's the uh, it is oh. it is Cafe Press slash ERB Podcast dot com. It will be in the show notes, so people can just click on it there. Um, so. Um, uh, Jess, do you want to plug anything specific before we go? Take home a griff today. <laughs> um, well, once again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, boys and girls, this has been my total pleasure. I always enjoy talking with uh, with Tim and Scott, and we have such a great time here. And I will plug my Facebook discussion group, Love of All Things Edgar Rice Burles, where we talk ERB, Tarzan, Ant Men, and and all of Burroughs' works per near 24-7. For Love of All Things Edgar Rice Burroughs on Facebook. Okay, all thank right. you. And we appreciate everybody listening, and we will back, hopefully be back with more content soon.